Hello everyone. Today I will be talking to you guys about the selective subject of the first year, the conflicts of law. So today I'll be giving you guys an introduction to the conflicts of laws, then overview over some legal terminology, as well as the key concepts which are held important with regard to this subject, and throw a bit of case law in just for good measure as well. All right, so let's get straight to it. So, conflict of law focuses on the selection of the appropriate legal system to govern a dispute with an international element. Basically, this means where a situation or a conflict that arises where local courts will be forced to enforce foreign law or apply foreign law. The best example I can give you is, let's take, for example, a Frenchman committing a crime in the in one of the states of America. In such a situation, does the US legal system have the jurisdiction to press charges against such a person? What law is applied? Is it the French law or the US law? All these questions bring about issues, and all these issues will be solved through the conflicts of law. Conflicts of law is also known as private international law. Now, private international law concerns relations across different legal jurisdictions between persons, companies, and most importantly, other legal entities. So therefore, it, it's not only limited to a dispute between a country and a person. It can be between two pe people of different heritages. It can be between two companies of two different countries. Or it can be between two countries itself. So factors to be considered and which are targeted and which are considered important when it comes to solving such issues in conflicts of law is the jurisdiction, the choice of law, the recognition of the foreign law applicable, and the enforcement of foreign law applied. So, mainly, that is what we will be learning within this subject. What jurisdiction falls to a person who's committed a crime in another country. What is choice of law? How, how are we actually going to see? What does it mean? What law can be applied? Recognition. If foreign law is recognized by a court, how is it done? What needs to be proved? And then finally, enforcement of a prior decision in a foreign court. Will a court be able to enforce a decision given by a prior court? Even though sometimes they might not have the same legal standing or jurisdiction. All these issues will be solved throughout the syllabus of conflicts of law. So before we actually head into the conflicts of law, let's go through some legal terminology. Oh yeah. So one thing I forgot to mention to you, in conflicts of law, we always take the point of view of the English court. Unlike in other subjects where we take the point of view of the local courts. In conflicts of law, we should always remember we are looking at a case, we are looking at a concept, we are looking at a dispute in the point of view of an English court. Now, let's get back to legal terminology. So, there's a lot of legal terminologies, but then again, it's quite easy to remember. It's not something that's far-fetched, it's not something hard to, you know, memorize, if that's what you're good at. So basically, most of the legal terminology are in Latin, and don't worry, they always start with either an L or an F. <laughs> so, yeah. So let's move on to our first word, forum. Forum is basically the place of the jurisdiction, or in other words, the court of justice. The second terminology I want you guys to remember is forum of convenience. Now, forum of convenience is a, ter it's a term that is used for a situation where the court which is most suitable to deal with a single dispute. Then you have forum non-convenience. This is the opposite of forum convenience. Forum non-convenience talks about a court not exercising the jurisdiction over a certain person or a company when a much suitable court is available. You will get, we will be talking about these situations in brief right now, but we will go in depth to them when the time permits us to. So next word is lex causae. The law of the legal system applicable to the dispute. Then we have lex domicile, law of a person's domicile. 
Domicile is also one of the key chapters we will be learning under this subject. Lex Fori, the law of the place where the case is heard. Then we have Lex Lois Celebratunis, the law of the place where the marriage was consummated. Lex Lois Contractus, the law of the place where the contract was formed. Lex Lois Damni, the law of the place where harm is suffered. Lex Lois Delicti, which means the law of the place where the tort or delict occurred. Lex Lois Solutions, the law of the place where the contract was performed. Lex Cetus, the law of the place where the property was situated. So those are the main Latin terms that you need to remember when we do when we go through this syllabus. And don't worry, it's easy to remember, like I said, it always starts with either an F or an L. Alright, moving on. Countries. So as you might already know, we have to define what a country is. Because right now we know private international law or law of conflicts apply to persons, legal entities, and companies. So, but why didn't we mention countries? In countries of law, a country is not defined by its territory or its political boundaries. Then how is a country defined in law of conflicts? It's quite simple. A country is defined as an area where the same legal system applies. The best example I can give you with regard to this is the United Kingdom, where England, Scotland, and Ireland are considered countries, even though they term themselves in a political aspect as the United Kingdom. If you take the United States or any other federal government, states like in states like Texas, Florida, and other states are considered as countries, even though politically and geographically we call them the United States. So that's something to remember that a country is not defined by geographical or political boundaries in the law of conflicts, but by the applicability of the same jurisdiction. Proper law. Proper law is a concept that will pop up now and again. So what is proper law? Proper law quite simply means a substantive law applicable when a conflict of law occurs. That's quite a simple and short definition for proper law. And now you must be wondering what substantive law is. So, substantive law is a set of laws that governs and defines rights and responsibilities of the citizens of a state. So, one thing you have to remember is it only defines and governs rights and responsibilities, which means laying it all out on paper. However, the other type of law is procedural law. Procedural law means the rules by which a court hears and determines the procedure of administering justice and also public policy. So it's a more practical aspect on how the procedure of court is carried out. What cases to hear, what laws to be applied, and all of that. So now we talked about law of conflicts and we just talked about proper law, substantive law and definition of a country. So let's move on to like I told you, like I told you, procedure to enforce foreign law, because that is one main aspect that is quite important in conflicts of law. All right, so there are four steps for the procedure to enforce foreign law. The first one being characterization of the dispute. The second being find whether the relevant courts have the required jurisdiction. Thirdly. Selecting the law of the legal system applicable to the dispute, depending on relevant factors, and finally applying the expert's evidence. So this is the procedure which is followed by all the courts to enforce foreign law within their legal system. So how are we going to characterize a dispute? So disputes, like many things, can be characterized in different ways. There are different methods, different legal systems use different strategies, or how can I put this more simply, different ways of using the characterization of the dispute, as you can see in the cases of Ogden versus Ogden or the recall cases. So let's take a look at some of the well-known approaches of characterization, as well as other approaches taken by some courts for the characterization of a dispute. So the main approaches taken are the first one being true lex fori. 
where the court categorizes according to form, where domestic laws and foreign laws are considered to their nearest similarities. It's quite simply put and quite simply understandable. The second one being true lex causa, where the characterization takes place according to the legal system the foreign rule belongs to. So just to break those two main approaches down, true lex foreign, we are going to consider the foreign law element to its closest similarity to the domestic laws which we have. While in Lex Causa, we compare the foreign law according to the legal system and char characterize it according to how the foreign legal system applies the foreign law. So therefore, it's a foreign law that is applied through Lex Causa, while Lex Fowey, the foreign law may be modified up to a certain extent. And then we have other situations especially in contracts, when we can take in disputes with regard to contracts. In contracts, the key case in contracts is the choice of law, as seen in the Amin Rashid case versus Great Insurance Company. It was held that by lawyer Diplock that the choice of law is what prevails as the proper law in a contract, which clearly means that the parties of a contract have the ability to choose the law which is applicable in a contract. Now, we talked about categorizing these disputes, but how can we prove it before the courts that the categorization has been done correctly? In order to do so, the procedural laws of Lex Fowry give us three main factors to take into consideration. What evidence has to be proved being the first, secondly, how to prove it, and finally, the sufficiency of the evidence. So, if we manage to categorize it properly and prove the relevant evidence, then again, foreign law may be applicable. So there are other factors to consider, like remoteness of damages, determining the timing factor. I will not go into them today, but I will be when we proceed further in this discussion. So moving on to the second factor, where application of foreign law. So like I mentioned earlier, Courts are not just going to apply foreign law just because someone brings it up. There has to be evidence to back up the foreign law. And the reason why foreign law is required, as I mentioned, is because judges do not have enough knowledge regarding certain laws in foreign jurisdictions. So it's important for the judges to hear about it, to be given evidence to decide whether or not foreign law is applicable. So there is a number of cases where different standards have been set with regard to the proof of foreign law. The Duke Wellington case where the judge just treat foreign law as a question of fact. In this case, it was proved that even though a conflict arises between experts, evidence is given by experts in the situation. The court can take the experts' knowledge and their evidence given and decide whether or not they can use foreign law. However, that did not set the standard. Who is an expert? Why? What are the qualifications of an expert? However, in the Cooper King case, it was held that experts need not have any professional or academic qualifications, which was kind of kind of hard to understand why. But then again, in the Bruce Rose Sequel case, that judgment of the Cooper King case was overturned where it said experts can be foreign judges or legal practitioners. However, it should be known that even if experts provide evidence, evidence, the judges still have the ability to neglect all that evidence apply English law, as it was seen in the Zector versus Zector case. So just because evidence is given by experts of the field, it does not mean the English court will always accept that evidence and give their judgment. They might not accept that evidence, they might neglect that evidence and apply the English law as they see fit. Now we move on to another part of interest, the admissibility of prior decisions. Like I said earlier, we're dealing with two jurisdictions of courts. We have a foreign element as well as a domestic element. So in such a situation, let's say, Court proceedings have been carried out and it's already been finished in a particular country. And then the English court, say, when, and then the English court says, 
which has started proceedings. In such a situation, can the English court accept the prior decision of a foreign court? Well, it's up for debate, quite honestly. However, there are some countries which carry out common law. And in that instances, they do not accept the prior decisions of a foreign court. However, if the foreign decision is said to be just, then the English court will have the ability to accept the admission, to accept the application of foreign law and thereby use the same judgment given by a foreign court. So, coming back to the use of foreign law, the burden of proof, who should actually prove that foreign law is applicable? Well, the foreign law, well, foreign law is applicable and the burden of proof is on the party relying on it. So, in a situation where a foreign citizen comes to Sri Lanka and says, I want to be governed under my law, he has to be able to prove that there is sufficient evidence that there are laws ascertaining to the crime he is charged with. However, if you take into consideration the Zekta versus Zekta case, sufficient proof of reliable evidence, if it's not available, then the courts will apply English law nonetheless. So, moving on to dispense with proof of foreign law. So, you do not need proof with regard to foreign law in certain instances because it's quite obvious that those laws can be used due to the following reasons. So there are three main instances where proof is dispensed with regard to application of foreign law. That is, number one, if the statute allows it, number two, if the parties agree to it, and number three, if the parties take notice of notorious facts. Let me re repeat number three, if the parties take notice of notorious facts. What does this actually mean? It's quite hard to wrap your head around as you hear it for the first time. So, parties take notice of notorious fact is, it depends on the intention of the parties. If a party says that is wrong, and if both parties agree to it, stating it's not something wrong, it's not a crime, then there's no need to prove foreign law. Because there's no need to prove anything because the crime has not taken place. The best example is the fact that roulette, which is a casino game, is legal in Monte Carlo, even though it's not legal in many other countries. That is because both parties entering into that game of roulette know that it is considered a crime in some areas, but they do not consider it so. Therefore, it does not become a crime. So that is basically what that means. So weight of evidence in foreign law. So like I said, sufficiency of evidence, how much weight should we actually give evidence with regard to foreign law. So the standard that was set in the Tolina case was if foreign law does not contradict the common law, it can be accepted without question. However, if the foreign law is either inconsistent or absurd, it is not bound to be accepted, which actually makes quite a lot of sense. I mean, if the law is absurd, even if it's from for if, even if it's a foreign law, you cannot apply it in the situation of a conflict. And finally, we come to the final segment of today: exclusion of foreign law. So, foreign law may be excluded by courts entirely, and in such situations, they don't need to prove any evidence or anything. All they need, all the court needs to do, is state this law falls under this category, and therefore we will not be considering it at all. So the types of law that fall under the exclusion of foreign law are basically foreign penal laws, foreign revenue laws, and public policies of foreign countries. And this was seen mainly in the case of Restate of Norway's application. So just to give you guys a quick wrap up of what we did here today. So first of all, we talked about what conflicts of law is, how it's applicable. Then we talked about a number of legal terms. Then we came into the definition of a country, the procedure of, to deal with conflicts of law, the fact how evidence must be proved, why law, foreign law is accepted in some situations while it's not accepted in other cases, and we just put in a lot of case law into that as well. So guys, my advice to you would be just go through a couple of notes and you'll get it in a heartbeat. It's not that hard to 
it's not that hard to figure it out. So until next time, take care. Hope everyone's doing okay. See you later.